I see ChatGPT as a powerful tool, but I think we need to offer some caution about what we do with it, especially in the legal space. If we're doing content creation through these tools, are they ready for that yet? Are they ready for the nuance it's required? And don't we still need that human element, which is so beautiful in the law, to have the idea that builds on the other idea? Algorithms will be great, but I think we need to be careful about thought leadership in that regard. Hey, everyone. Welcome back to Answering Legal's Everything Except the Law podcast. I am your host, Nick Worker. If this is your first time tuning in, this is the podcast where we share expert advice on all the parts of running a law firm that attorneys weren't exactly trained for back in law school. Now, I'm very excited for our episode today. If you've listened to the show before, you know that marketing is my first love. It's really my true love, honestly. Um, And my guest for this conversation is one of the leading voices in the world of legal marketing. Whoa. (laughs) Well, he it's might disagree. From here. <laughs> he might disagree, but uh, Roy Sexton, the Legal Marketing Association's international president, joins me now. With a title like that, you can't really disagree with me. No, although I'm sitting in my basement with all my Star Wars ephemera and my basketball shorts, but I put on a clean shirt for you. I I sort of combed my hair. It's Thursday. It's you know, I, I don't see all of. The, oh, I do kind of see like Boba Fett or Django Fett yeah, behind there's, you. There's more. There's a Yoda. There's. It's my husband's a saint. I see. <laughs> I see the uh, the Infinity Gauntlet. Gauntlet. I'm not a, oh yeah, I have Agamotto. I got all kinds of crap back there. See, and that's just one part of. That's just one wall of the house. I need my wife to let me get like a Star Wars room in our house because I'm jealous of what you've got going on. Well, there. When we, when we bought this house, it's far too large for two old gay men and one tiny dog, but I, I got the basement and I got one spare bedroom, which we call the crazy room. And that's where all the collectibles go. Of course they sneak into other parts of the house. And eventually my husband goes, Hey, I thought we had a, an agreement that the main floor looked like adults lived here. And so, okay, fine. It reminds me of, uh, the big bang theory when, uh, Penny starts moving all of, uh, Leonard's yes like Penny's been secretly moving all your memorabilia into a storage unit what yep oh speaking of which Penny is my husband because uh this is a couple years ago we were thinking about selling the house we didn't and he gently showed up with all these tubs and he said don't get mad at me (laughs) I opened a storage unit you don't have to get rid of anything I just thought it might help you know and I was game for it. And I just started, it's not organized. I just started scooping things into these tubs. Of course, I've now bought things more since. And uh, I still think some some 12-year-old nerd in this neighborhood will come by this house at the right time. And I'll give him a key and go, open an eBay store. I don't even want to know what's in it. Just, it's all yours. Enjoy. I'm, I'm not 12, but I'll gladly come by. Okay, maybe I'll give you the key. I'll take it. Um so for those who might not already be familiar with you somehow, uh, <laughs> I've totally shot your introduction. No, <laughs> I'm having a great time. You can't shoot my introduction in that way. Okay. Um, can you tell us a little bit about your marketing background and how sure. you ended up taking on leadership positions for the legal marketing association? Yeah. And I, you know, I, I, I started, I'll start at birth. No, I, I <laughs> have always had a, a fairly serendipitous career. Um, you know, I like to eat and have a roof over my head and buy collectibles. So, you know, my undergrad, I went to a small all male college at Wabash college and had a full scholarship because my parents had no money. And, <laughs> and I, they said, study what you like. And I studied English and theater because that's what I liked. And then I thought, Oh, and then I doubled down and got a master's in theater at Ohio State because I thought, well, I'll teach. And I realized, no, I, I do like to eat and that's not going to work out for me. So I uh, ended up going into alumni fundraising, stuff like that. And Deloitte Consulting was on campus one day recruiting. This is back at Wabash. I went to work there and they they hired me and moved me up to, D- to Detroit. And uh, I got into healthcare then. And over time, I was hired into a healthcare system doing strategic planning, which in healthcare is a little different than other industries. It's very much about facility planning and demographics. How I ended up with that job, I don't know, but I really liked it. And I found that I could learn all the tactical stuff pretty quickly because of that liberal arts background. But what I brought to the conversation was conversation, listening to what people needed and weaving a narrative together. And over time, I got my MBA because my husband said, why don't you get a degree that makes some sense? Good advice. And that was when the healthcare system said, why don't you take over marketing? Marketing and strategic planning were part of the same division. And that was about 15 years ago. And that was when 
I really felt like, and it was like 35 at that time. Okay. I know what my career path is. I like this. I like weaving together the story that will compel people in that case, patients to choose our healthcare system and our, our providers. And we did radio shows and did a lot of cool things, very consumer facing uh, efforts. And after about five years of that, I thought, I want to try something else. And this is, I worked with an executive coach once who said, you just throw yourself in harm's way without thinking, don't you? And I said, yeah. So I just threw my resume out there. And uh, a law firm locally that did mortgage foreclosure, which I didn't know was kind of a, you know, not the most palatable thing to do. Um, they hired me and they wanted me to be their VP of marketing. And I was so taken by the title and the opportunity. And I just threw myself in. But I also realized, okay, there are limits. There are cultural differences between healthcare and legal and whatever you do. And you have to adjust the techniques that may have worked for you in one space to really honor the voices around the table and the new industry you're part of. And that's, that's when I joined the Legal Marketing Association. And it really transformed my life and career. I think I've been a member since 2011, so, you know, 12 years. Um, and I met people who thought and felt and conducted themselves like I did. And I sponged it all up. And I was just on another call. And there's this nice young man from St. Louis, David Meyer, who just attended his first annual conference. And his enthusiasm and joy, I was like, oh, I remember that. He felt like he'd found his people who saw him, honored him. Working with attorneys is not easy. And it's not, you know, sometimes people get stuck on that attorney personality thing. I don't like that. I don't think that's fair. These are busy people. These are sometimes introverted people. These are people who are, who are fixated on language and the, the precision of language. So marketers, if they don't have that sensitivity to the personality, they're not going to succeed. And that's where Legal Marketing Association helped me. I made early friends, Nancy Merlin, Gail Marsh, Heather Marsh, Gina Rubel, Lindsay Griffiths, Laura Toledo, people who adopted me and said, come over here, let's talk, let's meet you, let's find out what drives you. And those were my mentors early on. And I'll leave you with this thought so that in this ramble, I remember my first conference was in Dallas uh, and it was in one of those uh, Gaylord biodome kind of things they are so strange that like canals and restaurants and you never leave or see the light of day. And Alicia Souter, who uh, is uh, one of the principals at Growth Play, she was president that year. And I didn't know her. I wouldn't know her for years, but she came out on stage as president. And I sat there right on the front row dutifully like, this is cool. I'm, a, I'm with rock stars. And I thought to myself, I hope I get to do that one day. And that's the kind of organization it is that about a decade later, with a lot of attention and a lot of love and a lot of, you know, hard knocks, I, I got there and got to do that. And it, it meant the world to me and has felt like a pinnacle in my career. But I will always, always be grateful to the Legal Marketing Association and the legal industry for at the late state of my life going, this is what I do. Um, and I, I think marketing in legal is fascinating work. And my family's are like, what do you do? Why do lawyers need marketers? I'm like, because to your point, as you introduce this, just like with doctors, they're trained in a guild fashion to learn a set of tasks. And then we throw them at the deep end of the pool and say, run a business. Now, doctors are a little better than lawyers at saying, I'm out. I don't want to do the accounting and the marketing. Fine. Lawyers aren't, you know, they're not prone to trust. That's partly why they ended up in this profession. So I think it's harder for them to sometimes lean into their operational teams and let them do what they do. But when you get there, it's pretty magical. Fun fact about me, the I think one of the only A's I got in college was... Uh, Theater 102 at Binghamton. And I'm a big reader. So, like, if you ask me to read a really interesting play with a lot of, yeah. uh, like, we read The Goat, we read uh, The Zoo, and I'm, mm. I love all that stuff. It's yeah. just like crazy stuff. Mm -hmm. If you, I, I'm not going to say it out loud, but if you know what I'm talking about, you know how insane yeah. both of those plays they're, are. They're, that you, you picked a couple of great absurdist works there. For oh, sure. And I love absurdist works. So, the, the class was perfect for me. Um, but uh, I did the, I, I, I took the same route. I tried to do things that were interesting to me. Um, and then I was just asked to join this company. Oh, you know, we're answering phone calls for law firms. Why don't you just come and try to do phone sales? Yeah. And uh, so I feel very lucky that I was taken in by, by this group of people because it's just serendipity for me. I was going to go, what was I even trying to do at that point? I was trying to become yeah. an accountant at one point. Yeah, I thought I'd be a lawyer. I thought I'd be an actor. I thought I'd do any number of things. And then this is kind of how it 
was, you know, I'm not a, I'm not a person of overt faith, but the older I get, the more I think there is some kind of serendipitous path you are meant to follow if you're open to it. Maybe I'm more Zen and Buddhist in that way, but just let it in, let it happen and be open to it. And that's why, you know, some people, I hate when people go, tell us the books you're reading now. And I'm like, well, there's a stack of comic books upstairs and three people magazines and four children's books and the new thing by Tom Hanks. And maybe I'll read them or they'll go in the pile of all the things I think I'll read one day. But I do, I don't read who moved my cheese or any of that kind of stuff. I read plays. I read novels. I read historical fiction. I read biographies because I learn from that. One of the transformative books I ever read, well, two, The World is Flat by Thomas Friedman, which is a bit of a cliche now, and then uh, a biography of Michael Eisner and his missteps at Disney. And I, I was just fascinated. I thought, oh, I don't ever want to do that. Oh, that's interesting. Maybe that. Nope, not that. And, you know, to me, that's those are the wor works that inform the human condition informs for me the way I do my work. And I want to be creatively inspired. I'm actually reading um, yeah. my friend wrote a book. Oh, congratulations. Uh, it's great. Isn't that cool? Jackie well, Siron wrote the okay. book. I forget the name of the book, but it's about her personal struggles with mental health. And she has a podcast. Oh, I mean, uh, I'm sorry for the struggles, but I'm glad people are sharing that. It's important. Yeah, I mean, exactly. Right. Like if you don't talk about it, then the problem stays hidden. Oh. Can't solve a problem that you don't yep. uh, agree exists. Um, I do want to spotlight this. So obviously you were at Legal Marketing Association's conference a couple of weeks ago. I mentioned this before we started recording. Um, you kicked off the general session in a very, what I will call memorable and exciting way. And I, I said, I said to my team before we got on, I cannot say anything about this because given the opportunity, I do exactly what this guy did. Um, <laughs> I'm the karaoke guy in my friend group. You know what I'm oh, saying? Good. Like, let's what's go. Your, do what's your go-to karaoke song? I, you know, I'm, I'm obsessed with the killers. So I do a lot of oh. the killers. But oh. the Goo Goo Dolls is like in my vocal range, so I do a lot of Goo Goo Dolls as well. I love the Killers. One of my, I, I sent, the, as an aside, the AV crew is wonderful in this conference. And they wanted, you know, pre-show music and walk-on music. And they said, could you send us some suggestions? So I put a Spotify playlist together. It had 300 tracks. <laughs> and they're like, oh, okay. And magically, they picked out all the right ones and timed it perfectly because they needed like six. Uh, but one of them was The Killers, uh, The Man. I love that song. I love that song. I love that song. It's um, such a swagger, but it's also subversive about gender. I just think it's a, I love that track. They're a good band. I've seen them more times than I care to admit. Uh, Brandon Flowers is great. <sighs> anyway, okay. So you want me to yeah. tell what the hell I did? Yeah, what'd you do? Um, <laughs> How do I make this concise? So I don't make anything concise. Good luck to you and what you do with this recording. But I, a year ago, I was in our ba Vegas at that conference. And uh, Lisa Kamen is this wonderful marketing person we have on the team. And I snuck into their war room where they hide from us. And she's like, oh, God. And I said, hey, I know you're eating a sandwich. But next year, I want to sing Born This Way. Come And I wanted to come from the back of the house. That was my idea at the time. And she said, well, are you going to come in in an egg? Because she's that person. It's really dry. <laughs> I said, uh, maybe. And we kind of put, she put, she put a pin in that, but she didn't tell me no. And uh, then the year went by and I kept practicing the song in my car. I downloaded a karaoke track and got the rights. I, whatever I think on the interwebs that you get the rights to do these things. I have them somewhere in my email, Lady Gaga, don't be mad. Uh, and I, I changed a couple of lyrics. There's some that are a little problematic now, 15, 20 years later. And I stuck in LMA a couple places. I'm like, this is going to be working. This is great. And Lisa was on board with it. And then I had this picture of my mom. My mom passed about a year and a half ago. And it's me and her looking in the mirror. I'm a baby. And that song, as you know, starts with, my mama told me when I was young, we are all born superstars. She rolled her hair and put her lipstick on in the glass of her boudoir. And that was what, like, I wanted that. The theater guy was like, I want that on screen. Um, and... As things have evolved in Florida, and I won't make any political comments, I, you know, we were talking about other theming for parties and things around the conference, and people would say things like, let's do Havana Nights, and I felt like that's like cultural appropriation, I don't like that. And for me, the venue in Miami, it was 80s, it was glam, it was flash, I knew the drag queen community was very strong in Miami, one of the hotbeds of where it all began in the States, and so I said, I, I want a drag queen and I want some... 80s, I want an 80s night, and I want some impersonators. That was about the depth of my thinking. So they found Athena Dion, and we had a conversation, and I said, I know what we need to do, because I saw what was happening in Florida, and I was getting these emails. There are always these helpful people 
who don't understand the nature of contracts and planning and that you pick a venue years in advance and you're kind of stuck where you're stuck. And they're like, we should cancel. We need to leave Florida. Let's make a statement. And I'm like, uh, yeah, that's not practical. And also there are people there who are not in agreement with some of what's going on. They need other people to come and say, we love you. So I said, okay, here's what I want to do, guys. We good with this? 8.30 in the morning. I want to come on, head to toe sequence, start from backstage with the first little verse. And I even got crazy. I pulled in some of Beyonce's uh, You Won't Break My Soul, Madonna's Express Yourself, and uh, Let's Get Loud from uh, J-Lo. And one person was like, do you want to do that? I said, yeah, I do. I want to have, I want to have my gays go crazy with the Easter eggs. I'm, I love Taylor Swift enough. I want all the people of color to go, oh, something's happening. So I started that off stage. And then I come on stage and I've seen the video and I look like a stuffed sausage wrapped in sequins. I wish I'd, I wish I'd lost some weight, but you know what? It works. The fact that I'm old and fat and crazy and come out looking this way, it all adds to the, the impact. And I start singing the rest of the song and the audience is just like, what is he doing? But they're loving it. <laughs> and I had all my buddies around the front row. I'd given enough warning to people to say, you want to be there at 830. Get through the first verse of the song. And then I say, what is it? Don't be a drag, just be a queen. Don't be a drag, just be a queen. Ladies and gentlemen, Athena Dion. And she came out and she had this diaphanous chiffon rainbow thing. And they're like, how long did you guys rehearse? I was like 10 minutes yesterday. It didn't matter. All we needed was that costume. And then everybody was on their feet. And regardless of how anybody might be feeling politically or was in that room, it was nothing but love. It was just we're going to have some fun and we're going to celebrate everybody. That was the point. And then after I didn't want to just have, okay, now we had a performing drag queen and she goes away. I said, I, we, I want her to tell her story. So our transition then into the business of the, the conference was why did we do that? It's time to tell our story. So I talked about my mom and it's interesting. I had written something very glowing about my mother that was effusive and how supportive she was. She wasn't in my early days. And I had a conversation with my boss Saturday night before the conference that we just, one of those chats, wine and Tostitos. And I had a wonderful picture of her I posted and she said, well, you gotta take that down. I go, okay. Uh, but it, it changed what I said. And what I said was born this way, those are the words I wish my mom had said to me, but she didn't. One day she did come around, but be an advocate for yourself if you don't have one in your life and advocate for others. And then Athena told her story about being bullied and why you know she sort of found her superpower with this performance uh, that she does. And it just, it set us off on the right path. And yes, it was wildly self-indulgent, but you know, I, I wanted to make a memory. I knew I had one big swing at this and, uh, and I was like, we got to record this. I want it out in the world. I want people to see it because I, we needed to send a message of inclusion without being pedantic, uh, as I am being now, but it's fun to armchair this in reverse and tell the story about how we got where we got. And I'm sure the audience is like, I stopped following him three anecdotes ago, but you know, there was a lot of love that went into that. And it was not just me. It was our team, our co-chairs. There were enough people aware of what I wanted to do and supportive of it. And that gave me the strength to do it. Cause there were a couple times in the weeks prior, I'm like, what exactly do I think I'm doing? Cause that's the kind of thing that either going to land or it's going to be really uncomfortable. So thank you for letting me tell that. And thanks for watching from afar and, and being someone who would do that yourself, because I think that's what we need right now. I love that there are performers out there that are just, you know, some of the alternative acts that are out there just in a granny dress and a gray wig. And I'm like, good, you know, d make your statement and, and show people that we all belong. I can't tell you the amount of respect that I have for what you did. Um, but I can tell you, that my wife, when she sees this episode, will 100% confirm that I would 100% also do what you did. Maybe I wouldn't have had like the uh, the idea to go as far as you did with uh, all the <laughs> conversations because it's just not my struggle. But given the opportunity to dress up in the in the black sequins and everything, you have, 100% I'm there. I'll do the. I don't. She knows me. I'll sing. It. She gets you mad. At, she be, she'll be cooking and I'm singing her some made up song and I go in. She's like, stop singing, make yourself a plate and shut up. <laughs> That's me. I love you, Katie. I'm sorry. We uh, love you, Katie. My <laughs> husband has a beautiful voice. He doesn't think he can sing. And I hear him. He likes to sing the Star Spangled Banner in the shower sometimes. Uh, yeah, I don't. And it's lovely. And I'm always like, why don't you? 
And I one birthday, I should get him voice lessons. I haven't done it yet. His birthday's coming up, and I've already spent the money, so I'm not going to do it. But I, he really, you know, that I think everybody can sing. They just need to find their voice and feel comfortable and, and express themselves that way. It's 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 one of the great joys of my life. And I didn't I didn't say I was in grade school choir. And I never did musicals. I never did any of that until I was like 27. I'd been, I taught myself to sing listening to Barbara Streisand, Dean Martin, Lena Horne, Sammy Davis, and uh, Whitney. And, uh, and my mom, who had done a lot of theater and had vocal training, I got cast in the musical The Fantastics, and she was terrified. She's like, and I opened my mouth. I was Matt, the, the boy. And she goes, oh, he's going to be all right. you know. So I, I think it's sometimes just having that moment of, I don't care what anybody thinks. I want to do this and it brings me joy and I hope it brings other people joy. Uh, my dad is a rather round old Jewish man. And uh, I, I think when I was like, that, except for the Jewish part, <laughs> when I was like 15, um, was, my dad is like a tough guy, like from Brooklyn. Oh, I'm, I'm tough on this. And one day he comes home and he's like, Oh, I just auditioned to be Rev Tevya in a local theater production. And he got it. And he couldn't do the scheduling, so he ended up being the understudy. And I was like, oh, my God, my tough guy dad. That's a, that's a, and that is a tough part. And to get cast, I was Perchick in the longest-running production of Fiddler on the Roof of Community Theater here in Detroit. We we started rehearsal in, like, October, and we didn't launch until spring because our cast kept turning over. People kept leaving. I'm like, is this theater in Michigan? But it's a great show, and that's a great part. And just sometimes just getting the part, whether you perform it, that's validation, too. That's what he wanted. He wanted somebody to tell him that he could. And then he came home and he was like, ah, I kind of could, but I'm not going to because I'm a dad and I run a business. And uh, and he's like, and I'm good enough to sing it, but I don't know if I'm good enough to do the rest of it. And he was happy. Yeah. I was proud of him. I forgot about that. I'm going to call him up and talk you about should. that. You always got it. That's the other thing I said from the stage. I said, tell people what they mean to you in the moment when it will mean something to them. We, we, we hold back on telling people these things until a funeral or, and it, it just saying to somebody, I like what you're wearing, or I like what you did. It's not fawning. It just, it's, it get, puts wind in their sails. I, uh, one last thing on this point. I, I don't know if you know the song, Mr. Tanner. It's not Cat Stevens. It'll come, it'll occur to me. It's one of those singer songwriters from the seventies. Um, and Laura Benanti, who's a Broadway person, she covers it. And if you YouTube this, it's going to break your heart. It's a song about a man who's a dry cleaner in a small town and he loves to sing and everybody in the town says you should do something with this you should do something with this and one day probably about my age he rents a hall in new york he, he doesn't live in new york he rents a hall in new york and he does you know a showcase and then in the middle of the song i'll probably cry telling this there's a pause it's in the original work and then laura does this too and they read the review that actually this man got and it's his critic that says just this eviscerating a nice attempt, but doesn't have the right vocal quality to make this a real career. He should he should look he should look for um, uh, uh, you know business elsewhere. Something like that. I, I don't have it right. And then they pick the song back up, and I that song just haunts me because that's the antithesis of what I'm talking about. There's always somebody that's gonna say, "Oh, that thing that brings you joy." You're not good enough as this other person to do that. You should do something else. And we must never do that to people in this life. You know, if that brings you joy, do it. I know you're kidding about your wife and the she wants you to eat. But, you know, we really absolutely have to live in service to others. And when they find their place of joy, just celebrate them for it. Um, and I, I, that so I would, again, I keep telling you things to Google or the re audience Google Laura Benanti singing Mr. Tanner and you're in for a trip and it's, it's haunting. And it, I think it's a great message to, to remember. So. I'm going to Google that after this. Um, but I want to ask you, so obviously yeah, we gotta get back on track. I'm not, I'm like, I'm like Robin Williams. I'm sorry. I'm having a great time. So you don't Good. have to apologize to me. Um, I'll, I'll, I apologize to your listeners and viewers. I, if you're not entertained, then I just, at some point, I don't understand that. But listen, everybody's got different taste. Um, That's true. So the Legal Marketing Association obviously just, obviously just had its annual conference. Um, yeah. For those who didn't get the chance to attend, can you take us inside this year's event? Um, what were some of the topics yeah. of conversation that really dominated the conference this year? Yeah, uh, and it, it's it's such a rich event over two or three days. And it's ironic. It felt like attending my wedding times eight because I, I missed out on most of the stuff because I was like Mickey Mouse in the Utilidor that had to pop up and 
say tip your waiter periodically and stuff. But um, you know, our co-chairs Megan McKeon, uh, Jen Dizo, and Lee Watts did a remarkable job taking the thread of an idea I'd put out there, which was amplify our voices, our careers, our profession, and encouraging. I think it, it can be a very discouraging job when you work in marketing in a law firm, if, especially if you're a solo marketer in a, in, a, in a small firm. Maybe it's your first marketing job. You're trying to take your guidance from attorneys and they're coming to you saying, I don't like the golf balls you picked and I want different salary at the event. And you don't get to to chew on the bigger questions that you need to. So I was hoping that people would leave the conference empowered not to be um, uh, you know, disrespectful in their home firms, but just to say there are bigger questions we can be asking. And I think we took a big swing at that and, and we got there. I've, I've heard that feedback. Again, I was just on a, a call with our St. Louis local group that was doing a debrief on the conference. And what I was hearing from people was they got that. So that was our big overarching desire. Um, we had pre-cons to that effect. We had a career development one, other things that, that w went really well, but in terms of broad reaching themes and there are an above the law article just came out from Jeremy Barker that summarizes our GC panel. And that would be something to check out. There will be recordings of the conference that people can download if they want. But, you know, there were, there were some particular threads that I thought were crucial DEI and inclusion. We had three or four different sessions on that topic. And then we had some pre-con deep dives on that. And by that, not just what we were doing two or three years ago, which is, you know, put up a happy Ramadan post, but really being meaningful and thoughtful about what inclusion is. Uh, on the final day, we always have a general counsel panel that is one of the kind of the highlights of the conference. We did that in a game show format, which was great fun. Jen came up with it and she, she killed it. And they did. They had three elements. They had two truths, two truths and a lie. They had a version of Kill Mary that they called strike, which it was a different thing. And they had panel paddles. And then they had a match game where they would write a word like, I love legal alerts that blank. So that was the format. And it, and it, it prompted fun. Um, uh, Peter Nguyen, uh, Jody Trulove, and uh, Arash Darudi were our panelists. But they also hit this DEI piece and they, and they were very pointed about it. They said, do not just add of a lawyer of color to your panel and not let them speak. Because one of the general counsel said, I'm gonna call that person and have, and said, why didn't you speak in that presentation? And they said, I wasn't supposed to. So we're doing ourselves a disservice if we're not authentically bringing people to the table and empowering their voices. One of the things that GC said as well, is tangential to this, because we always pick on, do you wanna to go to football games and things or not? And they said, please don't take me to a football game. It's not an inclusive activity. It assumes people wanna watch football. They might wanna to go to a musical. Take me to something I would enjoy, but more importantly, just have dinner with me. Or even better, come to my company and visit and see how we do the work we do. That was one of the things I was like, duh. So instead of planning a cocktail party and trying to convince people to come to your office to see how pretty it is, go to their offices, find out how they work, learn what they do. It's a different form of inclusion, but it's showing people they are seen and heard. So that was a theme we heard both in kind of the overt traditional DEI fashion, but also just the, the humanistic nature of what inclusion really is. And I, I thought that was a point driven home really beautifully. There was a lot of conversation, I know we'll get to it about AI and chat GPT, of course, that's really hot for people. But I think again, positioning it as not just grabbing a technology you want or feel like you're gonna be left behind, but what is the purpose for it? Why are you doing it? And, and what are you hoping to achieve? And does it really work within your culture? Um, I, it was a lot of orientation around client teams and client interviews It's such an interesting challenge in law firms. This happened to me in my first firm when I was in healthcare, we were survey happy. We asked our customers all the time, what do you like? Don't like. So I applied that same principle in my first firm and I got my butt handed to me when I came back with the survey results. They didn't even want to look at the survey results. They didn't like the way I'd written the survey. And that's all the executive committee wanted to talk about. I didn't like this question. I said, well, what we heard is they don't like the way we answer the phone. And we don't, they don't like they get bounced around. Can we fix that? No, we're not going to address that. And I, I think it's interesting that attorneys will fight this very important step, which is hear what your clients want from you. It might make you uncomfortable. It might mean you have to change, but otherwise if you give them the impression you're not interested, they're just going to switch to another firm and they're never going to tell you why. 
and you're going to blame marketing and you're going to blame the billing and you're going to blame all these other things. And it's you, you know, we know that in our, our home lives, our relationships, our families ask and take the hard feedback. That's why I'm glad I went trained as an actor being those director's notes are life. I might not like what I'm hearing, but they're looking out for me. So I perform better. And so I, you know, that whole intention, the other thing we had throughout the conference were a fishbowl format. And I'm not answering your question with any coherence at all. But uh, what I liked about the fishbowl format, and if you know what that is, it's that basically it's a session led by the attendees themselves. There are kind of three moderators. And we, would, we had five of them, and they were always after kind of a key segment of conference presentation. So it might have been MarTech. It might have been client uh, engagement. It was DEI. And then the group had this time to digest and talk about and then share their best practices with each other. And I hope that's something we can continue because there's what you get from a panel speaking at you about podcasting or any number of tactical things, but you have to take that moment as a, an adult learner to digest that and brag about what you're doing and hear what other people are doing. Because what I love about the community and any of the conferences we have, there's an open sharing of what people are doing. And I and sometimes like, well, doesn't that hurt your competitive edge. I'm like, no, what you're doing versus how you do it are two different things. So how I execute something is going to be different than how somebody else did, but hearing their ideas and building on them, that makes us stronger as a profession. And that was really key to the, the, the construction of the event itself. We will be right back after this short ad. How our business works is that we get phone calls all during the day after five o'clock, during the night, weekends, all the time. It's hard to have somebody on staff to answer calls 24 hours, seven days a week. My name is Neil Gainsburg. I'm the owner and principal of Gainsburg Law here in Chicago, Illinois. We're there to protect individual rights and collect compensation for individuals that have been injured or harmed in some way. So we've been a customer of Answering Legal since approximately 2015. When we're not there, after hours, evenings, nights, weekends, they'll answer the call like somebody at Gainsburg Law is ready and willing to answer the phone call. They'll be our, our virtual receptionist. We can then concentrate on other legal needs if we have a big trial coming up, if we have depositions we have to take. And most importantly, they're able to patch potential new business, new clients to us. And these new clients get that personal touch of speaking to somebody when they call in. We look forward to helping the greater Chicagoland community and the state of Illinois in the many years to come. I know you mentioned AI. Um, are you seeing already or hearing about any law firms that are using AI to assist with like their marketing related tasks? To and what do you to a degree? Um, and I'm going to be a bit of a contrarian here. Um, you know, we always joke that law firms love to be uh, first to be second. <laughs> you know, they don't want to be the first to do something. This is one of those instances where I actually think it might serve us well. I mean, we're even seeing in the tech community people coming forward saying, uh, you know, I saw 2000. I know what Hal can do. So I'm like, you know, what do we really hope to achieve with this? And so I have my own cautious interest in what this will be. And I'm enough of a weirdo that when people are too breathlessly enthusiastic and you get those kind of early pundits that are almost shaming, you must know this and it's important. I'm always like, yeah, I don't know that I feel that way yet. And this is going to be a weird analogy. I tried it on LinkedIn and it felt like a landed like a thud. I feel like chat GPT is like Clubhouse was a couple years ago. Everyone was like, Clubhouse is going to kill Facebook. It's going to be the best thing ever. You must be on Clubhouse. Why are you on Clubhouse? And I joined Clubhouse and I'm like, I, I don't want to sit here and listen to people without their bodies going on and on and on and on. While I, you know, I like social media because I can watch Bravo's Below Deck and just kind of surf through things. I don't want to have to listen to this stuff. And it didn't quite take. I don't think it did. I, I, I apparently Sandra Bullock is following me on on Clubhouse, I got that notification the other day. I don't think it's really the real Sandra Bullock, but I'm going to pretend it is. I hope it is. I, I don't, you know, I don't do anything with Clubhouse. I think ChatGPT obviously has far more, and this is what people don't understand when I say things like this. I see ChatGPT as a powerful tool, much like Google search was 20 years ago. And when we first saw the internet and with their, you know, I mean, there it is disruptive. 
But I think we need to offer some caution about what we do with it, especially in the legal space. You know, I used to use ghostwriters at my first firm because the attorneys liked that. They didn't want to write. Then every other firm I went to, the word was sacred to them. They don't want someone else writing for them. So I, and from an ethical perspective, we got to look at if we're doing content creation through these tools, are they ready for that yet? Are they ready for the nuance it's required? And don't we still need that human element, which is so beautiful in the law, to have the idea that builds on the other idea? Algorithms will be great, but I think we need to be careful about thought leadership in that regard. I do think, and there are tools to do this already, but not as well as I think they could. I think with the social media engagement and that kind of thing, using those tools to have authentic responses when you don't want to respond to everybody on social media would be lovely. I think law firms would benefit from that. It's not legal advice. It's softer. You know, I always loved that Southwest Airlines, before they fell apart, really responded to everybody on social media. I thought that was a great differentiator for them. And that if you said, I'm having a terrible time at Delta, you heard from Southwest. Here's a voucher. That's you hilarious. Know, to me, that's good stuff. And that's where these tools could enable, I think, more of that. But again, I think you have to keep those people behind the scenes. And the attorneys will probably be the first to rush, not to displace themselves, but to displace the overhead of their marketing team and others and said, well, this chat function will do all my marketing for me. No, it, it won't. You still need someone to translate, understand, figure out what your culture is, and then bring those tools in where they make sense. I also think there are different, you know, corporate law, you know, I always have these people come to me and say, don't you want a virtual assistant to pop on your website and answer people's questions? And I'm like, not really, because I lose then the opportunity for them to connect to a human being, which is what I'm selling. But if I'm, you know, uh, a mesothelioma attorney or, uh, you know, you're in a car accident and you want to, you know, maybe. So I think there are different, and I'm not just, I'm not diminishing those applications. Those are important, but I just think there are different segments of the law that will probably use these tools differently. And I, you know, this is a long ramble to come to the point. I don't understand it myself. So it's probably where some of my agnosticism comes in and I'm showing my age. I'm like, could be really cool, but I'd like the smart people to figure it out really well first before we start throwing it on our website and other places. It, it, it causes me some anxiety from an intellectual property perspective, from an ethical perspective, uh, because the the language we use around law firms has to be has to thread the needle both for our internal audience and our external audience and i don't know that we're quite there yet but what do you think about it i should ask you you're you're younger and smarter i actually feel a very similar way to you that 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 you do um because i re i'm a big search guy i i came up during um like seo content marketing before google ads was really yeah sort of the uh, Wet well, said, main driver of traffic to your website. Yeah. Um, and everybody, I would go to conferences and everybody would say the internet of things. Oh um, well, yeah, I forgot that was, that was another one for a while. I forgot about that. They told me voice search was going to kill uh, Google search. And I said, I said, no, it's no, it's not um, like I'm not investing my time. I, I honestly didn't even bother to optimize anything for voice search. And that was my, like my main job function. Um, and, uh, like, I just never believed that you were going to be able to like on your fridge search for, a like a, an answering service. I, I just right. wasn't concerned about it. Why would uh, I want that? Or why do I want a TV on my fridge when I have one that's 10 feet away in my family room? Things that I'm just like, I, I'm good and it's going to break. And now I have a fridge that works with a TV that does with a cracked screen. And everybody is looking at my cracked screen on my fridge. You know right. what I'm saying? Uh, so I feel very. I I'm using chat GPT, but I use it for like very menial tasks. Like I'll yeah. ask it to respond to an email or I'll ask it to mm -hmm. respond to a review or I'll ask it where I should eat tonight um, based right. on my current mood, you know, and, it, and I find it interesting. I haven't found yet that I need it for a practical application for anything that I'm doing work wise. What I have done that I think it was so much fun to hear this idea come to life. So my team, I came to them with an idea, you know, it's a hot topic. We have to be involved in it. Let's talk about chat GPT. But what I want you to do is get chat GPT to write you a blog post in the style of the website 
however you figure out how to prompt it to do that, right? Have some fun with it. And then uh, like, be like, oh, gotcha, that was chat GPT. And then explain your process and using it and how you were able to do it. So I've had fun um, and, and my team has done a really good job with that. Reading it was super interesting. It's actually coming out, I think, uh, in like oh, a good. week or two. Um, but I'm just cautiously optimistic. I, I just, the, the amount of horror stories that I've heard so far with um, it makes up fake things. Yeah. It's not currently up to date. And or then I'm like, concerned with the images that come forth with like six fingers on a hand. And you're like, okay, I'm um, Dolly wept. And I'm concerned that like, it'll be this. Um, I don't want to say like an embarrassment, but it gives you similar answers for a lot of things. Right. So when everybody's putting out the same stuff, there's no longer like the quality there. Right. Um, and I, you know, I, I, say this often when I'm talking to the attorneys about social media, because it, it's interesting. The attorneys will tell you relationships drive my business. What's the silver bullet to make me have a lot of relationships? I'm like, there, there is no silver bullet for that. There is no golf outing. There is no chocolate scent. There is no chat GPT. There is no someone auto posting on your behalf. Take, oh, I don't have time for that. You have time to make a big production out of what golf clubs you're going to buy for whatever. You can take 10 minutes a day and go on social media and be authentic. Who's important to you? Andy Warhol was right. We all are there now. What did I eat for breakfast? And I, you know, I just bought a new shirt and who cares? But that's important to that person posting it. So acknowledge it. You know, that's the, that's the, the cachet that will make them want to talk to you about your profession. Not something that makes it super easy for you to get around because people see it. They know when you're shortcutting relationship development. So if you can use the tool to help you be authentic, great. But if you're trying to use it to get out of being authentic or because you're too self-conscious or you still feel like you're in the eighth grade and you're going to be rejected from the lunch table, don't do it. And that's where, you know, I will come back to Thomas Friedman's The World is Flat. I've read like three books as an adult. What I liked about that book, and it's very, it's like 800 pages and it's dull, but he's like, and here's the printing press, and that's what happened, and here's the space, space shuttle. And, but some of the disruptions, we don't always know they're happening when they're happening. Everybody's so eager to go, this is the disruption, and you're like, no, it's actually happening over there, and you're missing it. And I, the, the chapter, when he talks about music, and how the music industry, you're a musician, and I think I am, how the music industry forgot they were selling music for a while. And they wanted to protect the CD and make it more expensive and put it in cardboard boxes. Duh, 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 duh. And then this crazy, whatever they were, the ones who ended up making, I saw the social network. I can't remember the kid that started the, whatever the, oh, uh, whatever it was. Napster. Napster. Uh, you know, that was happening behind the scenes. People were like, oh, that'll go away. No one's going to want to stream music. Well, you miss the convenience of it. The fact that even I, and I'm a physical, I like physical media. I still buy some CDs and albums that I want to have in case there's Armageddon and I want to play them and I can't stream anything. Of course, I want electricity, but yeah. Um, you know, I, we didn't, we, they didn't account for that. And then they had to play catch up and realize, you know, what you're selling is music and personalities, not the product in which it's captured. We saw that in the, the photo industry as well. It's like, Yes, sometimes people will still want to have a physical photo, but mostly they're going to move to everything's on my phone. And that's where Apple was actively disrupting all these other industries and people weren't really paying attention to it. They were blithely buying the phones and doing the things. And I'm sure if we go back in time, there were people declaring all kinds of things about what is going to happen in this industry and that industry. And really, it was it was this damn thing that changed all of it. So that's that's where I'm old hmm. enough to go, let's just... Let's see if the hula hoop sticks or not. I want to talk about this because I, I actually think I actually think that this is something that you definitely believe in. I'll be shocked if you if you're a contrarian on this. So the I would say the past like five years, the the whole how you should run your law firm yes. is out there and it's everybody's pushing client centric, which is a good thing. I'm I'm a big sure. proponent of client centric. What's your opinion on being client centric? How what what does being client centric look like to you? And is I think you're I know where you're going with this, and I do agree with you. Again, I feel like you know when I was young, I would buy Men's Health magazine, thinking by buying the magazine it would make me look like the men on the cover. 
<laughs> it never did. I did learn how to pack a suitcase from one issue of Men's Health, so it was worth the subscription. Like you fold a suit? Things. Yeah, you roll things, and I'm pretty good okay. now at packing suitcase. Like, I can get everything in one little tiny bag. Um, except for that conference, I had two mammoth suitcases. Because I had a lot of sequins I had to bring with me. Um, but I, I think we give a lot of lip service Client service, client service, you know, and, and we don't really peel back the onion on what does that mean? And that's what, what I loved about our GC panel at the conference. They were, Arash Taruti particularly, he's at Fender and he's just, he's Israeli and little tight leather jackets and tight jeans. And he's just, you know, he's, he's working at being like, I will see the provocative thing and make your heads explode. And God love him, he did. But, you know, they were saying those things. If people were taking the time to listen, we, we go... Come to the client team's panel and learn how to put a process and a structure together and an accountability matrix and a blah, blah, blah. Great. But again, if you're so busy putting your matrix together that you're not picking up the phone for five minutes and calling the person who's been paying you a lot of money to say, how are you? I don't need to invite you to a glass blowing event or a Chicago Cubs game. How are you? How is your family? How is the work going? How is our relationship? To me, and I'm my colleagues would I hate that I'm saying this, just teach your attorneys to take the time to do that. And if they're not willing, let them let you do that. Because and and you don't have to do it with every single client you have, but there's you know who's who's bringing in more money than others, and you also know the ones that have potential. That's where some authentic conversations and I, I that's I will always, I'm not one for phone calls. I hate them. I'm always like, this person wants to talk to me now, regardless of what I'm doing in my life. But a phone call goes a long way sometimes, 10, 15 minutes just to say, how are you? I'm checking in. I don't know if that's where you were going with this, but I feel like it's it's a basic quality of the human condition. And I think the pandemic, if people were listening and paying attention, many of us loved being disconnected from the world because we didn't have the extraneous noise of people. Did you ever read the short story Harrison Bergeron by uh, Kurt Vonnegut? No, but I... I'm going somewhere with yes, this. So I love Kurt Vonnegut. He's from Indiana. He's nuts. And this it's short nuts. story is about a society that wants to make everybody equal. And so if you have gifts, you, are, you receive a, a governor that prevents you from accessing that gift. So if you're a great musician, you have headphones on that are noisy and you can't hear music. If you are a great runner, you have weights on your legs. And at some point, Harrison Bergeron is the most talented of all. So he's strapped down with weights and headphones and everything. And he starts ripping them off. And he starts flying, literally. And they shoot him and kill him. You're going, where is this going? I feel like we do that sometimes with things like client engagement. We put on all these governors and weights and, and we get away from what is the core thing we need to do, which is have a check-in, an authentic one that's not billed, that it does not have an agenda, is not an upsell. It is just saying, how are we doing? Now, I don't know if that's where you were going with it, but I do feel we get a little cutesy with process around this and miss the larger point. I'll, I'll, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to jump off your point here. I wasn't going there with this, but I, but I kind of was because I just wanted your opinion on what being client centric looks like. And to me, yes, it is giving the client everything that they want in order to like have success with your law firm, right? Let them define how they want to work with you. But what, the best law firms that I speak to are the law firms that hire people and let them do what they're best at. Yes. And that, yes. And that, yes. That constantly evolves. Yes. Um, and the reason that I know that that works is I'll give you a good example. Um, when I started here, I started low man on the totem pole. I've worked, I'm here almost 10 years. Mm -hmm. Um, and I've continually gotten promoted and more freedom and more, uh, employees and access and this, that, the third, the last few weeks, I'm just working on all the stuff. Nobody's checking in on me. Nobody's talking to me. I'm just Fair sending point. things out into the universe. And, uh, I had to put, a meeting on the CEO's calendar. And I was like, I need you to give me just like a little bit of feedback, right? I have like a little too much autonomy right now. What's going on? What can we be working on? How can I assist you? Here's what my department's doing. You know, here's like, let's put a game plan together. Um, but that freedom to do what 
I need to do in order to like help the company grow and, and get our name out there and, and, uh, and really what we do is sort of like, we're the intermediary between what we want to sell and how it's perceived. Yeah. So, uh, you know, right now my team and I are just having fun. We're, we're making videos, but, we're hyping people up. But You're exactly right. And I think that's such an important point. Hire the right people. I, I was in a show, uh, Mr. Vedwin Drew, a few years ago, and it was one of the best theater experiences I've had. And the director is someone who works with adult learning and, and children who have learning disabilities and things. And that's awesome. I said, how, why was this such a great experience? And he goes, well, I know you actors are limited. I'm like, thanks a lot. And he goes, I cast for culture, not talent. I'm like, okay, double whopper. Uh, and so I put a cast together where I know they're going to gel. They have the, they have the ability to do what I need them to do. And then from a learning perspective, we start with the music. Cause many times you rehearse a musical, it's one day music, one day choreography, one day book week after week. And your brain is like, bruh, bruh. he didn't do it that way. We did music for like three weeks, nothing else. And we got that in our bones. And then we did choreography and because we knew the music and we got that in our bones. And then we brought in the script like two weeks before we opened. I'm like, how are we going to get through this? But we had all that other stuff. So we built up, but he let us lean into who we were, but put the right guardrails around it to your point saying, I'm doing good stuff, but is it the right stuff? Is it what you need? We all need that kind of triangulation back and forth. And I think we're in many ways, we're saying different versions of the same thing. I leaped into just call and pick up the phone, to, but it goes back to Arash's point too. go visit your client where they do the work. So you can anticipate their needs because what I'm not saying is the client is always right about everything. Cause you could find yourself, you're a lawyer. You're supposed to challenge the client's expectations, but deliver the outcomes they want. But just like Steve Jobs, give people what they didn't expect because you were anticipating what they might need. And the only way I know how to do that, I can only speak for myself, is really, I'm a slow learner. I like to be in cohorts. I like to be around a group of people for some period of time and get to know them. And then I let my freak flag out. I didn't show up at LMA on day one wearing sequins singing Born This Way. I insinuated myself. I learned the culture. I learned what they were about. I absorbed it. I learned, I, I benefited from it. And then I said, now I want to give you my message back. And I hope 10 years from now, there's somebody else who does their version of that. That's life. I love dance remixes. I love interpretive things. I like when someone takes something and does something else with it. We're always building on what someone else has done before. And the only way you can do that is by letting people lean into their strengths but not letting them run roughshod and then giving them that guidance. And I think that's how you have a good client dynamic. You, you have to hear from them what their pain points are and what their needs are, but then you have to learn who they are. And that takes a little time and, and you have to figure out your way of doing that. That's why I loved uh, <laughs> when you were talking about your survey and the partners were like, but we don't like the way you worded the question. Like who yeah. cares how the question was worded? Let's, right. let's learn about <laughs> what people's concerns are and that they don't, mm -hmm. I don't know. They don't like the way what you said, but they don't want to be bounced around on the phone. It was just, simple stuff too. You know, just, I just you know. be on hold, go get the guy and, and, or tell me he can't mm -hmm. and call me back. You know, yeah. I, I don't yeah. want to be bounced yeah. around from person to person. Mm -hmm. It's infuriating. Mm -hmm. I actually very much identify with that. Yeah, uh, I do, do. I hate phone trees. I always uh, start hitting zero and go person, person, human, human. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Zero is is my go to, and I'm that it guy. Usually works. Yeah. Um, so obviously, you're the you're the Legal Marketing Association 2023 International President. Yeah. What are you hoping to accomplish during your time as president? Um, the, the, what did you think? Lose. What did you think you were going to do, and what are you doing? I don't lose all my friends in the process. <laughs> I do. I joked at the conference. I, I, why I'm saying these things out loud? It's like being president of a home association from hell. You're like, Gee, God. You know what? I, what I what I love about the job is the ability to offer my thoughts and hopefully coach and inspire some people to take it seriously and and make the most of it. What I don't like about the job is much like what I don't like about law firms. It's the variability, which is can be really thrilling. But it's also who's coming in hot in my inbox about why and how do I have to now adjust my mental state to help get that person to a point of, is this really the most important thing? You know, and you don't want to, you don't want to dismiss the concern, but you're also in your head going, really? Um, so that, you know, those are the parts of the job that just are inevitable. Um, but it's truly the honor of my life to get to do this. And I can't wait for December 31st. 
<laughs> um, but, you know, I my people have asked me, what were your goals for this year? And I'm not a goal. I'm not really a goals person. I just have never been. I think the only child in me is like, let me boil the water slowly around everybody and see where we end up, which is a horrible analogy. But, you know, for me, it was about empowering uh, folks to have their authentic voices at the table and to feel like they could go into their law firms with respect and say, there are other things we could be doing. Let me tell you about them and find a way to collaborate back home. Uh, that, that's been important to me from the, the whole time. I want our members to feel like they have a career path, that this is a profession that can be chosen. Most of us ended up legal marketers inadvertently, but it is a place we could start to say, this is something people can choose. It's a viable career path. It's, it's lucrative. It's fulfilling. Um, you know, it's like wordle from hell every day and it can be really a wonderful intellectual challenge. Um, and you know, on the more presidential kind of things, you know, I want to see us continue to grow our membership. We, we got to 4,000 last year. We saw a dip with the pandemic. I'd like to see that get, if we get to 4,200, we had ambitions around 4,500. We ain't going to get there. Uh, 4,200 would be lovely if we can reach that. We have talks with, uh, United, uh, the Middle East and Africa for, uh, regions there, Australia, Asia. I, I don't think these things are going to be accomplished while I'm in the position and I don't care. I just want to get the ball rolling because we call ourselves the International Legal Marketing Association. And for a long time, that was Canada and America with members individually across the globe. Now we have a Europe region, which is thriving. And I'd like to see us have some purposeful, intentional outposts where people can commiserate and get together uh, as a community. Um, you know, the other thing for me is advocacy, I think remains an important thing. We did a, a survey with ALM. Uh, that gave us some really great insight, both from the marketer's perspective and the law firm's perspective about what marketing is and what its value is. I'd like to see us use that data thoughtfully to continue to enhance the perceptive value of what we do. Um, and the, the other other piece that we're working on right now is data governance, which is not doesn't sound sexy, but you know we're a bit the shoemaker's children when it comes to our own data. We we work with data in our firms and we we know about targeting and segmentation, but we're not doing that very well for ourselves and as an association. And my colleague Rachel Shields Williams, who's been in knowledge management and is just a, a brilliant soul around this, she's leading that work. Again, will that all get accomplished this year? Probably not. But did I get some threads going while I was there that we can think a bit more intentionally about our community? And I think. You know, one other thing that's important to me is the pandemic broke down, you know, I'm going to talk about regions on one hand, but it also broke down the artificiality of I'm in the Midwest and I'm in the East and I'm in the West. And, you know, people could attend anything they wanted, wherever they wanted. And I don't want us to lose that because I think that's great. Not everybody can afford to go to the annual conference every year. Not everybody can afford to go to our regional conferences. But if they're a member, they can attend all the Zooms they want. And why not jump? from region to region and locale to locale and get to know people around the globe who will enrich your experience. And I hope that's a, a cultural drumbeat we can continue. So, so to that point, um, what are some of the biggest benefits that lawyers will see from being a part of the LMA um, that they might not be currently aware of? Yeah, it's an interesting question when, you know, cause, and thank you, you sent these to me in advance and the audience is now going, really? Cause did he prepare? Um, I thought about that one a bit because typically we don't target lawyers for the Legal Marketing Association, but I think we could do more of that. We do have lawyers, practicing lawyers who are members, or we have people who trained as lawyers and now are in marketing roles. Our membership is generally comprised of people with marketing or business development in their titles in some form or fashion, or at one time they were, and now they've moved into a DEI role or a data management or whatever. But I think what is interesting about the community that I do think lawyers could benefit from, especially if they're a solo shop or they just want to jumpstart their own kind of muscle tone, or more importantly, to be an advocate for the marketing people they have in their offices, come to one of our events and just sample it. You can come to an event without being a member. It's a small surcharge for the lunch. It's like 20 bucks, or you can go to a conference. It's a little more expensive. You don't have to be a member yet, but come to one of the events and absorb the culture of best practice sharing and knowledge sharing. And you're, they, we have what we call our shared interest groups. And they're across a, a lot of, to me, that's one of the best things we do in many ways, because they're thematically based versus geography or anything else. So we've got one that's small firms. We've got one that's PR and media. We've got a social media one. We've got a MarTech one, DEI. 
And those groups are active all day long on message boards and through uh, webinars on those topics. And it's a great place if you've got something you want to deep dive and just learn from others who are in the trenches. That's what I think lawyers would benefit from. Lawyers are intellectually curious people. They like being part of a community. And I think they would enjoy the camaraderie. And I think they'd be a little surprised at how openly we share with one another. And I think some lawyers might bristle at, at first from that, but then they'd go, this is pretty cool. I, you know, I've been in other professional associations. I was in a bunch of health and healthcare and it was, we, there were state secrets and the service providers were in the hallway and we got a presentation and then we parted ways and there was no, Hey, let's have a drink and talk about what's your experience and what are you doing? That is unique to the legal marketing association, I believe. Um, and I think, I think attorneys would really gravitate toward that. So yes, I, I should speak about the substance and the, all of that, but I also think just the community and getting to be around some of these folks and learning what the experience of your operational people really is day to day can be eye opening. You know, I, I, we don't disparage any of our, 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 our lawyers, but I, I don't think they always quite appreciate the manner in which they're approaching us with an issue is not talk about client orientation and learning how people, they don't really know how we think. And we try like the Dickens to know how they think, but I think coming to some of the events would help that break down some of those walls. So if legal professionals and lawyers want to continue hearing your expertise, where can they go and where can our, they, our they won't, they're, they're done. They're like, Nope, we're good. Um, yep. I'm, I'm obnoxious on LinkedIn. Definitely send me a, a request on LinkedIn. I post far too much. Uh, and I will post things about legal marketing. I will post things about my dog. I will post things about Ronald McDonald House and Mosaic Youth Theater because I'm on those boards and you're going to get a mix of stuff. I'm not, I'm not a, I'm not a pure message person. I know it probably drives people crazy because some people use LinkedIn and they're like, I only post about podcasts. I'm like, well, not me. Uh, but you know, I'm, I'm there and I'm accessible and approachable. My Facebook page, I got, I got blue check marks. I, I, but I think I, it's just a cash grab, but I got, I got a pop up on Instagram after the conference. I'm like, what happened? They're like, you qualify for the blue check mark. And I'm like, well, I'll do $15. Sure. I'll do that. So I am on Instagram and Facebook and my, my Facebook page is public. My Twitter is public. So, you know, any of those places, and, you know, um, you know, feel free to drop me a line at rsexton at clarkhill.com. I'm, you know, open to conversation. I like it. I learn from, from dialogue. Um, and, you know, anybody that, that wants to be part of that, I, I have a blog that used to be about movie reviews, realroyreviews.com. We turned it into a couple of books that 10 people bought. I don't post any movie reviews anymore. It's pretty much constant legal marketing and a lot of self-promotional stuff. But that's another place people can find, find me. And I'm on Pinterest. You know, I get some of my best, my best drivers to my blog are from Pinterest. Interesting. I haven't been on Pinterest in a long time, but I used I, to. I, I have this kind of process I go through. Anytime I publish something on my blog, I'm like, okay, now it's going to go to Tumblr. I'm still on Tumblr. I'm one of six people. Uh, Pinterest. And I'm like, share, 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 share. And I just make sure there are little breadcrumbs everywhere. And when I go back and look at my stats, sometimes on my blog, I'm like, what? Why is Pinterest such a Pinterest. driver of my mother-in-law calls it pin interest. I like that. That's nice. My, so my husband has a tendency to make up. He likes to make up words. He, he uses the word noxic. And I say, honey, that's not a word. He goes, yeah, but noxious and toxic. And I go, well, maybe it should be a word. It's kind of a good noxic. one. Noxic. I'm going to call somebody that mm -hmm. and see what see they, they pick up on it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm going to, and I'll credit him. Don't worry. Great. Um, but Roy, thank you so much for joining me on the show today. Thanks um, for having me. Really appreciate it. Uh, had probably too much fun. I'm not going to lie. <laughs> Uh, we hope you enjoyed I, this conversation. I didn't, you know, we only got through half of your questions, so I, no, we I, got through all of them. I don't know what you're talking we? about. Yeah, we did yeah, great. Well, yeah, we kind of did, didn't we? We did. I, I speak in parentheticals, so I get to everything eventually. Yeah, we got around to it. Um, well, we hope all of our listeners enjoyed this episode, and we will be back with another episode of Everything Except the Law soon. Be sure to check out previous episodes of the show on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and the Answer and Legal YouTube channel. As always, links to everything covered today, including the song that we brought up by Laura Bonanti, I believe you said. Mr. Tanner. Yep. Will be found in the description of this episode. And we <laughs> hope to see you next time, everyone. <laughs>